All right, well, welcome to our conversation with Ryan Streeter, who is the Director of Domestic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, among many other things. Uh, Ryan, you know, the bio will be in the article of which uh, this is going to be a part, this video. So I won't go over it too much here now, but uh, uh, I've known him for several years through several of his uh, jobs at nonprofit groups uh, and, and writing on the charitable sector and civil society. Uh, and we'd also uh, like to, at the Giving Review, uh, welcome Craig Kennedy uh, to, to our activities. He's gonna be leading the questioning uh, of Ryan and I, Mike Hartman, a co-editor, one of three, am gonna defer to him. So uh, Craig, let loose. Ryan, I think is probably a little, uh, he's a little skittish, I can tell, about the difficult <laughs> questions coming forth, but uh, why don't we go ahead and, and proceed? Okay. Ryan, it's uh, great to be part of this conversation with you. Uh, you're someone that I've um, always really liked and admired, and especially now that uh, I guess I first met you when you were just a, a senior leader. Now you're a mogul of one third of all of AEI, so it's really cool to be part of this. Uh, let me get, get right into the questions. Um, you kind of stick out in the in the think tank community in a lot of ways because in Washington, because you've actually worked at the state and local levels of government. And I think the first time we met, we both agreed that maybe the most satisfying jobs we'd ever had was working for a mayor where you could actually see concrete things get done. How has your work in Indianapolis and Indiana shaped your view of public policy? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. And, and also, it's great to be with you here, Craig. I've uh, learned from you over the years a bunch and, and uh, have probably every day deploying um, advice and counsel you've given me over the years in, in my current job. And, um, and Mike, of course, great to be with you. Thanks for having, having me on here. Great to be, be back in touch with you. Um, I think the, the work that I've been able to do at the state and local level has had a pretty big impact on the way I view public policy issues. I think not sure about this, but I think I'm probably the only person at the American Enterprise Institute that's worked at the federal, state, and local level, kind of all three levels of government. It wasn't well, part of any plan I had. It's just the, the way opportunity presented itself. Um, but I think, you know, when I, when I worked for Steve Goldsmith, when he was the mayor of Indianapolis, this was in the, I call it the golden age of, of mayoral governance in America. The 1990s was a really interesting time. And I, I was fortunate enough to join Steve in the second term when he'd already developed quite a reputation. And um, it, it, for for a lot of his innovations, but this was the this was the era of welfare reform, of community policing, of school reform, of public housing reform. There were lots of things that were happening um, at the urban level, and mayors were making a name for themselves in in the in various ways. And it was fairly bipartisan. I mean, Rudy Giuliani was in New York, Steve was in Indianapolis, John Norquist was in Milwaukee, Rich um, Daly in Chicago, Daly in Chicago, Ed Rendell was actually in Philly at the time, Susan That's right. in San Diego. I mean, and, and all of these 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 mayors were, were dealing with some of these urban problems. So I I got to see kind of firsthand the way in which local leadership and the devolution of authority to local levels. And that was one, <clears throat> excuse me, that was one unique feature of a lot of these policy reforms was a transfer of power kind of under a great society model. Um, to uh, local leaders in, in this kind of wave of reforms that happened in the 1990s, uh, most of which, like I just mentioned, were focused on cities. And I began to see there was a direct connection between the success of a policy like welfare reform, where you were requiring people to go to work, and the health of the civil society in that community, that places that had an active and robust charitable sector, um, strong engagement from faith-based organizations, um, recognizable local leadership that was trusted, you actually had better outcomes. And this has been studied now in the, the years that have followed in, in, in a way that's been pretty persuasive in that the, the states that devolved as much authority as possible to cities generally saw better outcomes in terms of people's wages, in terms of uh, their attachment to work and, and so on. And that was because you really put the responsibility for implementing this policy of moving someone from a social safety net program into a world of, of, of work and upward mobility, you really put it at the community level. So I, I was glad that I got to be, a, that that was all on the front end of my life in public policy because it's really affected the way that I think about um, federal policy making, which I spend a lot of time here in Washington having to, having to think about, that we, um, we, we see a lot of policy making happening in Washington. And I would say both on the left and the right now, 
which focuses very much on sort of national solutions. And, and I think you, you, you generally are gonna set yourself up for either failure or limited success if you don't take into account the, the way in which policy plays itself out on the ground. So I, I think, yeah, I think that, that early on that, that experience has really affected the way that I think about uh, policymaking at every level. level. Do you think that movement of compassionate conservatism produced anything? Um, I think it's a mixed bag. I think there were some things that it achieved which have been enduring. And I think there were other things that were more aspirational about it that, that kind of fell by the wayside. Um, as far as the, the and, and I should say that it wasn't George W. Bush who really came up with the idea. I mean, that, that phrase was a part of the, the campaign. But you had lots of things happening before that time. Um, Dan Coates's leadership in the Senate, his project for American renewal. There was right. also a, a kind of a communitarian movement uh, on the left that Democrats embraced, which, which was also made it possible to have these discussions about community-based solutions in, in, in a broad room, right? And, and I remember back then, you, know, you, you were often, if you're at a think tank like AEI or Brookings, there are people on the right and the left who actually really kind of identified with the importance of these kind of localized solutions to, to problems. And so I think the, the Bush years sort of, you know, obviously that he campaigned not knowing 9-11 was going to happen, that obviously changed, changed a lot. Um, but one of the things I think that was a positive outcome there was there was a normalization of the role of community and especially religious organizations to solutions where there had been regulations written to bar them from participating in public efforts. I really think that initiative helped change the landscape there, updated the regulations, made it less scary to work with, with religious organizations. And, and so when you fast forward today, a lot of the fights in the public square about, about religion have more to do with hot button issues, right? I mean, it's, it's really focused more on whether religious organizations do or don't embrace same-sex marriage. And that's kind of where the fight has gone. But the, the legitimacy of community actors who are people of faith participating in the public square, it's sort of like that, that got settled and much more normalized. And a lot of the hostility to that kind of went, went away. Um, but, but I think that there were, there were some, in a piecemeal way, there were some successes on the policy front. We, we were able to create um, in the Bush years, a voucherized approach to drug treatment and, and addiction treatment that became something that states rolled out and were able to build on. We had a, a fairly successful um, experiment in multiple cities on the, the role of community-based organizations in prison reform and, and re-entry re and all of that. But these had, these had to do with just sort of individual um, entrepreneurship within the administration and, and um, it, it wasn't kind of a broad sweeping reform. So I think you know, a, lot of, a lot of what was aspirationally talked about early uh, in that movement kind of fell apart after 9-11 and as, as priorities changed. And really, since the kind of reaction, the midterm reaction to Obama's um, first two years in office, which has been known as the Tea Party election, it kind of nationalized conservative issues. Uh, and really, since, since the Tea Party victory, you don't really find a lot of of Republicans or policymakers on the right talking a whole lot about those community-based um, solutions. And so um, it doesn't mean it's gone away. Um, there are a number of us who still you know, try to write and talk about the importance of civil society and communities because we want policy to succeed. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's definitely, we're, we're at a time now where kind of nationalism and populism and, and a focus on Washington DC has sort of captured the imaginations of people on both the right and the left. And, and I'm actually quite concerned about that. Let me do just a quick follow-up. Um, when I was a young program officer at a left of center foundation in Chicago, I regularly worked with people at AEI and Heritage back in the 80s and early uh, 90s. Um, it was considered very, very common. What happened? Hmm. What, what broke up this ability for people to share ideas across ideologies. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure I don't actually know the full answer to that, that question. Um, but I'm reminded of something that was noted a couple centuries ago um, by David Hume, a famous Scottish philosopher of the Scottish en Enlightenment, when he, he wrote an essay kind of observing that there was something peculiar, he said, in, in the modern era, the modern era of his day, the mid, mid 18th century, where um, when, when you have the ability to organize people around abstract ideologies, they, they, they generally tend to get uh, worked up even more than they do about very practical things. And he, he noted that when political parties were focused on interests, 
um, you know, in his day, the, 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 the merchants in London or in Glasgow versus the, the people in the countryside, you know, they're agri agrarian and, and commercial interests, you would argue over those things. But the moment you start to fight over some abstract ideology, people's temper really goes up. And, um, and, I, and there have been others that have kind of observed over the years since then this kind of peculiar thing about um, attachment to abstraction, attachment to ideology that really gets people fired up. And I think in the time that's passed since the, the time frame that you're talking about, we, we really have seen the self-selection into kind of abstract ideological enclaves, which allows people the kind of almost luxury of letting their imaginations run wild and their passions to run wild. And it just spills out into the, into the public square. And so we, um, I, you know, I, obviously fueled by digital media, the ability, you know, I remember, we all remember back in the 90s when the prophets of the internet were telling us about how, you know, life would become decentralized, there would be the, the, the public commons, we would debate um, um, issues in, in common, and instead the exact opposite thing has happened. Um, it's, it's afforded us the um, ability to spend all of this time talking with people that we agree with and turning our ideological sort of opponents into uh, ideological enemies. Um, and so I think, and, and I think there have been certain changes politically that have also um, exacerbated that. I think, you know, we thought by um, putting sunlight into um, the political process, by putting televisions and in hearing rooms on Capitol Hill and in state houses that we would be making government more transparent, but we've created platforms for performance now. And so even political leaders that are supposed to be governing um, often have, have they, they can use their political lives as a way to make statements without ever really governing and even running for office kind of on that, that basis. And we've seen that happening on both the left and the right. So I think, I think there have been certain changes to our, the way we govern. Um, and I think this, this use of digital media has, has, really, has really contributed to that. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing when you look at some of those like Pew um, survey questions that they've been asking back to the 70s, you know, and they're, you know, when you would ask someone in the 70s, you know, how would you feel if your son or daughter came home from college dating someone of the opposite political party? You know, the majority of Americans just didn't care about that very much. And now, when you look at those numbers, it's a, it's it's a huge spike. You know, if so, if my son or daughter comes home dating a Democrat or a Republican, it's like an existential crisis. And so that's a new thing, right? It hasn't always been that way. Um, I think we know more about that now, so perhaps we can actually mitigate some of that in our own lives. And and, and maybe there are some reforms to the way we govern that would would actually help. But but right now, it's hard to be too optimistic about reversing those trends. Okay, so. Um... The giving review is all about advising donors on where to put their money. You've made a pretty eloquent case for a more local orientation to solving societal problems. What would be your advice to wealthy individuals, foundations, in terms of where they should be putting their money to address local problems? Um, yeah, great question. And I, I think that, you know, the, the short answer is that there's not just one, one answer, right? There, there are multiple places where you can have a, a real impact. I think one of the big challenges that we face right now as a country is a kind of decline in dynamism, is what I would call it, that um, by, by almost any objective measure, when people are aspiring to things in the future, what we consider to be essential to the American way of life and what people who care about outcomes that public policy can affect or um, social movements can affect, um, you know, this is, so, this is an issue to, to, to worry about, right? You can measure dynamism many different ways. How do people think about the future and orient their lives? One is the rate of new firm formation, you know, starting businesses. That's been in decline for decades now as a percentage of all business. Our businesses are getting older. Um, and consolidating, the, the number of new firms is declining. Uh, you can measure it at the household front by people's um, uh, desire to um, have kids and then fulfilling on that desire by, by having children. Our birth rates are declining in this country. We've actually just last year hit the, we've like flipped, you know, for the first time ever to, to a negative birth rate. The, the, um, you, can, you can measure this by people's mobility, their willingness to pick up and move to pursue opportunity. That's also been in decline. It's especially in decline for people with lower incomes, which that used to be exactly the reverse. It used to be that if you were in a declining town somewhere, um, you would move to the closest place that was, was growing and, um, and that's changed people. So there's this kind of stagnating effect in our, in our society. And it seems like um, 
looking at different ways to challenge that, whether through school reform, um, cultivating an entrepreneurial mindset um, in younger people, and then working with, with officials to make it easier to do things like start a new business, making it easier to move, reforms to the social safety net system. All of those are areas that really need attention that policymakers on their own right now don't seem equipped to um, address. Um, and I think it's a, it's a particularly unique place for um, philanthropists, people who want to invest their private resources to try to address some of these issues. And so you can, you can do that very locally. You can find organizations that are doing things that run counter to, to what I'm, I'm talking about. You can also fund state-based think tanks that are looking at changes to state laws that make it hard to do things like move and to start new businesses and, and discourage work and discourage family formation. Um, and then that you can support organizations that work at the federal level as well. So I think, I think there's room kind of in, in all those, those areas, but I think the, the amount of, of giving to kind of organizations with this concern, this concern for the future of dynamism in America is, is sort of underserved compared to what the, what the need is. And so the, and the last thing I'll say on that is I, I think that you know, there are lessons to be learned from um, a lot of, of entrepreneurial um, philanthropy in the 70s and 80s, um, where very, whether it was family foundations or individuals, there's a lot of coordination, right? And I, I mean, I came of age in this, this um, era as well. That's how I first met Mike when he was at Bradley. And a lot, of, a lot of, of, of people who were in a position to give were aware of what each other was doing. Um, there were some things that were pursued sort of in common as common objectives, but, but funding them in different ways, Fund, you know, funding a nonprofit initiative to achieve X, you know, school reform in a community, while at the same time funding a, a charity university of a scholar that was doing research that would help make the case for that. And, and, and some of that coordination seems to have, have cracked up as, as some foundations have, have closed or moved on. Um, there's a lot of great giving going on out there. Um, I would love it if there could be uh, an effort to sort of coordinate some of that again, to, to bring people together kind of around common cause. That seems to be the one thing that's missing right now in, in, in a way that could probably be fixed if, if people were intentional about it. Great. 